Okay. Hi, Alexa. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our eLotus webinar today. My name is Donna, and I will be your host and your moderator for today's class. For over two decades, eLotus has been your trusted source for TCM continued education for acupuncturists. We offer the largest selection of online CU courses with over 3,000 CE hours. And if you're new to eLotus, remember to sign up for an account today to receive a free 1CU course as a welcome gift. This offer is valid for new accounts only. So how is everyone? You know, as many states are heading back to becoming normal, we hope that you continue to stay safe and healthy. If you haven't been to our TCM COVID-19 resource page, we hope you can pay a visit after the webinar. You can find articles, formula information, and even a webinar on post-COVID syndrome and TCM treatments with Dr. John Chen. Without further ado, here's a quick introduction of today's webinar with Alexa on managing perimenopause with TCM. Alexa has been practicing acupuncture since 2005 and is the founder of InCircle Acupuncture since 2010. InCircle Acupuncture is a community acupuncture clinic in Nashville, Tennessee, with the mission to bring the benefits of acupuncture and TCM to more people by making services affordable and accessible. In the ensuing decade, her clinic has expanded to encompass two locations, a staff of multiple acupuncturists. InCircle has provided over 200,000 affordable acupuncture treatments since its founding and is the region's largest provider of acupuncture services. She is also the co-creator of Open Acu, an integrated online appointment scheduling and EHR software system designed for acupuncturists. Alexa serves as the chair of the Tennessee Board of Medical Examiners Advisory Committee for Acupuncture and in 2020 was named one of Nashville Business Journal's Women of Influence in the Trailblazer category. Congratulations. Okay, let's go ahead and welcome Alexa. Alexa, can you do a quick sound check before we get started? And I'll go ahead and stop my PowerPoint here so you can share yours. Okay, can, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you. I'm so glad to be here and I'm really excited to talk about this topic of perimenopause because it's something that affects a lot of my patients and probably affects a lot of everyone else's patients as well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and open up my PowerPoint. Here we go. All right. So um, again, my name is Alexa Hulsey. I am an acupuncturist in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I've been practicing acupuncture for 16 years. And so I've been doing community acupuncture for over a decade. And so everything that I'll be presenting today comes from my experience doing community acupuncture. But everything that I'm going to discuss really is applicable in any kind of practice setting, whether you're doing community acupuncture, private room acupuncture, hospital, wherever you're practicing, um, you're probably gonna be seeing some perimenopausal patients. And so I'm, I'm hoping that this is helpful. So let's get started. What is perimenopause? So perimenopause is a distinct phase. Alexa, really quick, you're not yes. sharing your PowerPoint. Oh, you're not seeing my power. Oh, I forgot to share my screen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs> let's go back to Zoom and let's share this. Okay. Can everybody see my screen now? Can you see yes, my screen? We can see it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So what is perimenopause? It is a distinct phase of life and it occurs in the years leading up to menopause. So menopause really is defined as one year without a menstrual period. A lot of times when patients will talk about being menopausal, what they really mean is that they're in perimenopause because they're still having periods, although they might not be regular periods and they're having all of these other symptoms along with it that they haven't previously had. Um, so um, perimenopause leads up to menopause. It's a distinct phase. It can last several years. It typically lasts six to eight years, which is a really long time to be experiencing these symptoms. And um, sometimes it can last 10 years or even longer. So it's a, it can be a long phase of life for some patients. 
most women will start to experience these symptoms of perimenopause in their 30s and 40s. And they can extend into their 50s depending on when, uh, you know, what at what age they experience their last period. Um, interestingly, it's some results of a study just came out a few days ago. There's a study called the Study of Women's Health Across the Nation. Um, so it's um, shortened as SWAN. And it's a longitudinal study that's been going on since 1994, just looking at all aspects of women's health. They just re released some results a few days ago that shows that Black, Asian, and Latinx women tend to enter perimenopause at an earlier age than white women. And they have a longer transition period and that they experience more hot flashes and vaginal symptoms. So this is an interesting consideration when you're working with different patient populations, be aware that patients of color are going to sometimes experience perimenopause at an earlier age. And this also means that some of the biological effects of menopause, such as um, decline in bone density, loss of muscle mass, um, increased cholesterol, those are also going to tend to hit women at an earlier age um, uh, if they are black, Latinx, um, Asian women. Um, they'll hit the, they'll, they'll just have those symptoms at an earlier age than white women. So I thought that was some pretty interesting results that just came out. So let's look at um, some of the symptoms of perimenopause. So one symptom that most people are aware of, uh, whether or not you've been through perimenopause is vasomotor symptoms. That's hot flashes, night sweats, flushing, just general feelings of heat. Um, this is a very um, well-known um, symptom of perimenopause. A lot of people experience this. We tend to think of vasomotor symptoms as something happening um, in older women after perimenopause, but um, or after menopause and after the periods end completely, but it can start for uh, some patients in their 30s and 40s. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, also, menstrual cycle changes are very typical during perimenopause, memory and cognition issues, um, changes in weight and weight distribution. This is a biggie that a lot of patients really struggle with. They feel like they are doing everything that they've done before. They haven't changed their diet. They're exercising the way that they've always exercised, but they're gaining weight and they cannot lose weight. And they tend to gain weight differently and they tend to gain weight more around the waist and the middle um, and have a very hard time losing weight. Mood changes are very typical, irritability, rage, um, fatigue and insomnia, hair loss, dry skin, truly the list goes on and on. I mean, there are, there are dozens of symptoms associated with perimenopause. I tend to think of perimenopause as puberty, the sequel. There are a lot of hormonal changes happening. And just like when a person goes through puberty, they feel like their body is not their own. All of these strange things happen during puberty. It's very similar in perimenopause. Your body's been, you know, doing its thing for a couple of decades. And then all of a sudden periods, periods are out of control. Moods are out of control. Everything feels different. You're tired. Um, and it's due to the hormonal changes happening in perimenopause. Um, the problem is that puberty lasts a few years, maybe perimenopause lasts a lot longer. Like I said, it can last a, up to a decade and even longer in some cases. And now perimenopause is occurring um, to someone who's an adult who has adult responsibilities. They have a job that they have to go to, or they have family responsibility and kids to raise. So um, experiencing these types of hormonal symptoms in middle age for years can be very distressing. Um, and we all have an expectation that when an adolescent goes through puberty, that they're going to be a little crazy, um, but we don't have the same expectation for women going through perimenopause. Um, they're expected to just continue on like normal. And um, we need to have, I, I feel like we need to have more of just a cultural understanding of what these changes are, how they affect women going through perimenopause, how they affect their families, 
how they affect them in their workplace, because these symptoms and these hormonal changes have far reaching effects. So um, I really like when I have the opportunity to talk to patients about this and um, just have a conversation about this, how this is a normal phase of life. It doesn't feel normal, but it is normal and, and we can help you get through this. Okay, so special considerations for perimenopausal patients. Um, a lot of patients going through perimenopause feel completely unprepared for what they're gonna be going through. A lot of people have never heard of perimenopause until they're experiencing it and they feel like they are just losing control. So, um, so people feel unprepared for this. They don't realize the kinds of changes that are going to happen. And so that's very stressful. They also have other increased stressors at this stage of life, because a lot of times this is when people are really reaching the height of their careers or, you know, working towards a promotion, job change, um, you know, really at full force in their workplace. And then they have all of these challenges uh, and these symptoms of perimenopause. Also, um, people might be raising kids at age, anything from, you, you might have toddlers in the home or teenagers. Um, so, uh, you're raising kids at the height of your career. Sometimes there are aging parents that a patient is dealing with. Um, so a lot of life stressors can happen at this stage, which just makes everything worse. Um, also, a lot of patients at this stage are dealing with fertility challenges. And so um, these fertility challenges, of course, are going to create more stress. And fertility treatments, which involve hormone therapy are going to further upset the body's natural hormone cycles. And so fertility challenges just really compound all of the other stressors of perimenopause. Also at this time, people are reckoning with a loss of fertility because the periods are becoming irregular. Um, you have a sense that they're going to come to an end at some point and uh, some women have put off having children. Um, some women want more children and um, they're having fertility challenges. Um, some, so there's just, a, there's just a reckoning that happens for some people when they're looking at the end of their fertile years and it can be very distressing. There are also the psychological effects of living in a culture that values youth and beauty. Uh, when the body is changing and is becoming less youthful. Um, so that can have a real psychological impact on people in perimenopause. Um, and, you, you know, if you think about how perimenopausal and postmenopausal women are typically depicted in pop culture, um, you know, a postmenopausal woman is depicted as old, cranky, bitter, um, and hot flashes are tend to be viewed as something uh, as, as good fodder for comedy. Uh, there's something that we can laugh at if we're watching television and someone's having a hot flash. Um, but it really uh, it really doesn't deal with the underlying seriousness of all the changes happening in perimenopause. So I feel like we just need to be having more conversations in general about this stage of life and about all of the stressors and all of the symptoms and what to expect, what's normal, what's not normal, and how to get through all of this. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, perimenopause can last for a very long time. So patients need a lot of support through all of this. So let's talk about some of the hormonal changes that occur during perimenopause. So estrogen levels fluctuate during perimenopause. There's not a steady decline in estrogen. Um, that's how we sometimes think about it, but the, the levels of estrogen in the body really fluctuate. And this is due to the, the feedback loop in, of our endocrine system. So um, one factor in this is there is the hormone inhibin. And inhibin naturally declines with age. Inhibin acts as a break on FSH. And FSH is a follicle stimulating hormone. 
So without as much inhibin in the body, the um, pituitary releases more FSH. That causes multiple follicles to be released. Um, and so the, ovary, the ovaries are releasing more eggs during ovulation. So estrogen levels can increase, then they can also decrease. Um, as estrogen levels decrease, then they're sending a signal back up to release more FSH. So more FSH is being released and then estrogen picks up again. Um, so there's a lot of fluctuation in estrogen levels. Um, there have been studies showing that perimenopausal women can have estrogen levels that are as high or even higher than women in their 20s and 30s, or women aged 20 to 35. This was a study out of Australia. Um, and it showed higher estrogen levels in perimenopausal women during both their mid-cycle and at the end of the cycle. So estrogen levels can be really high in perimenopause. They can also be low. Um, high estrogen levels um, usually cause bloating, breast tenderness, heavy periods, whereas low levels cause vasomotor symptoms, insomnia, fatigue, vaginal dryness, and loss of bone mass. And then progesterone levels decline in perimenopause. They don't fluctuate as much as the estrogen levels. Um, that's more of a steady decline. These can cause irregular periods, heavy periods, or long periods. And a lot of women report having heavier periods in perimenopause and shorter cycles. Um, and then testosterone levels also are gonna naturally decline with age. Another consideration too, is that high estrogen can increase cortisol. Um, and then also the increased stressors during this time of life uh, mean more cortisol. So a lot of times the body is full of cortisol, which can contribute to um, weight gain and weight retention. So a lot of hormonal changes happening during perimenopause. And, and I think the thing to understand is that that's, there's a lot of fluctuation. There's not just a steady decline in estrogen. So if we only approach it with the mindset that estrogen is declining, then, um, then we're not going to necessarily be best serving our patients. So it's important to pay attention to the symptoms. All right. So um, let's look at what the aging has to say about corresponding life stages. Age 35, a woman's um, yawning channel is declining her face withers and her hair begins to fall out. Um, at age 42, her three young channels begin to decline. Her facial complexion wanes and her hair turns white. And then at age 49, the Rin and Chong channels are both declining. The menstruation ends, her physique turns old and feeble and she can no longer conceive. And that is the seventh of the seven year cycles in, for women in the Neijing. And so that's it. <laughs> that's, that's all we get. We get to uh, get to age 49. And then um, after that, I, it's kind of anyone's guess. Um, in men's eight year cycles go to age 64 because they, they outline eight, eight year cycles for men in the Neijing. Um, now, of course, this is just one example. Um, there are other um, classic texts that address diseases of aging. Um, but I just think it's interesting that, um, that at age 49, that's when the seven year cycles stop for a woman. Um, and, and the, in reality is that until fairly recently, most women didn't live long enough to reach menopause. Um, so these perimenopausal years were kind of end of life years. Um, and then, um, women who did reach perimenopause were, were really not the norm. Um, it's interesting, um, other than humans, the only other mammals that have been observed to have a distinct menopausal phase of life are orcas or killer whales. Um, and the menopausal females or the non-reproductive females, um, in an orca pod are really the leaders 
of the pod and they retain all of this knowledge of um, feeding and ocean currents and navigation. And so the rest of the pod really looks to the older females in the pod for guidance and as leaders. But that's the anomaly. Um, really, there are not any other mammals who have a distinct postmenopausal phase of life. Um, and there have been studies on gorillas that show that most female gorillas who live past their childbearing age, they don't live much past their childbearing age, and um, most of them eventually die of starvation. Um, because they, um, they're just no longer considered, uh, having much of a use for, for the rest of the group, which is very sad, but we, um, we can, uh, really make this a better stage of life for women. And, um, so well, let's look at some typical TCM patterns of perimenopause. These are just a few, but these are the most common patterns that I observe when I'm working with perimenopausal patients. So um, decline in kidney yin and jing is very typical. Oops, I didn't mean to, um, I don't know how to get back. Um, hmm. Let me see if I can go back. There we go. So decline in um, kidney yin and jing is typical. There we go. Um, but that's not the only pattern, certainly. Um, kidney yin deficiency with deficient heat is also common. Liver chi stagnation with heat, liver blood stagnation. Blood deficiency can be typical in perimenopause, particularly of the liver, heart, and spleen and also just spleen chi deficiency with dampness. So if we approach all perimenopausal patients with the mindset of everybody's got kidney yin deficiency with heat, that's not necessarily going to be the correct diagnosis or the best diagnosis for every patient. Um, many of them do have that pattern, but there are a lot of other patterns as well. So of course we wanna pay attention to their signs and symptoms and what all is going on in their life. So I want to look at some of the most common perimenopausal symptoms. Um, there's not enough time today, unfortunately, to get into all of them um, because there are many, many symptoms that affect people in perimenopause. So I'm going to talk about some of the ones that I tend to see most typically and what my approach has been. Okay. So vasomotor symptoms, this is really one of the best known symptoms of perimenopause. These are hot flashes, night sweats, um, facial flushing and redness. And hot flashes really um, don't, I feel adequately describe the intense heat that some people experience. Um, some people describe it more as sort of a rolling heat that overtakes their body. Um, some some ex people experience it for just a quick amount of time, less than a minute. For other people, it goes on for a long time. Um, so flash is just one way to describe it, but I think of it more of a hot flush uh, where the whole body feels flushed with heat. And sometimes that can, sensation can stick around for a while. Um, so the exact mechanism of vasomotor symptoms is not entirely known. So we do know that estrogen is a vasodilator. So lower estrogen can cause more constriction of the blood vessels leading to more heat. Um, lower estrogen can also cause the hypothalamus to be more sensitive to the body's temperature changes. So the hypothalamus thinks that the body is too warm. Um, so um, some, some researchers believe that it's really um, just sort of a misreading of the body's thermostat by the hypothalamus. There's a higher rate of occurrence of vasomotor symptoms 
linked to smoking and obesity. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the SWAN study showed that Black, Asian, and Latinx women tend to have more vasomotor symptoms as well. Um, so a typical pattern of vasomotor symptoms is usually a pattern of liver and kidney yin deficiency with deficient heat and yang rising, but there can definitely be other patterns as well. So um, you want to see what other organ systems might be involved. Sometimes there's heart fire, sometimes there's heart blood deficiency, there can be stomach fire. Um, so when I'm working with a patient with vasomotor symptoms, I will, um, I'll usually sort of my, my first thinking will be liver and kidney yin deficiency, but then based on their symptoms, I might readjust my diagnosis. Um, so typical formulas that I use, Jirbai Di Huang Wan, Jia Wei Xiao Ya Wan, if it's more of a liver issue, the Evergreen Balance Heat Formula is really great. Um, that's a, just a good formula for um, nourishing kidney yin and clearing deficient heat. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about vasomotor symptoms because I feel like there's a lot of other good information out there um, about these. And so I wanna talk, spend more time talking about some of the other symptoms. All right, so mood changes. So this is a, a very typical symptom in perimenopause. Um, there was a study in 2008 that found that irritability is the primary mood complaint in 70% of perimenopausal women. So um, a, lot of, a lot of people experience this. Um, and some of the causes for this um, can be progesterone declining because progesterone in general has a calming and soothing effect on the mood. Um, estrogen tends to have more of um, an exciting effect on the mood but estrogen increases serotonin and dopamine levels. So if estrogen is declining, then serotonin and dopamine levels decline also. And those are your feel good neurotransmitters. And so estrogen, uh, too much estrogen can cause a sort of an excited, elevated mood. Too little estrogen can affect serotonin and dopamine. So really either kind of a change with estrogen can affect the mood. And then also as, peri as progesterone declines, then, um, then the mood suffers as well, for sure. Mood changes in perimenopause can be very severe. Um, and there's a term called perimenopausal rage. And this is a real thing that a lot of perimenopausal people experience. And um, it's, a, it's a feeling of complete loss of control of the mood um, and anger will really flare out of control. Um, part of the problem too, is that these mood changes fluctuate a lot. So irritability can really come and go depending on hormone fluctuations. And so sometimes these, uh, these irritable moods or these feelings of rage Feel like they're coming out of nowhere because they don't always correlate with the menstrual cycle. So when, um, when a person's having regular periods in their twenties and thirties, and they haven't been, uh, they haven't really entered into the perimenopausal, perimenopausal phase of life. Um, when they're having regular periods, a lot of women can pretty much predict when their mood is going to change, you know, often premenstrually or when the period starts, then um, the mood becomes irritable. Sometimes that happens around ovulation. But then once you enter the perimenopausal, perimenopausal phase, then these mood changes become less predictable. So it's not always just, oh, I get really irritable premenstrually. Sometimes it can feel like it comes out of nowhere because hormone fluctuations don't always follow a predictable pattern. So it feels like these mood changes are coming out of nowhere. Um, and then also a lack of sleep can contribute to this. And also um, hot flashes and night sweats can contribute to this. So if a patient is 
having night sweats, they're not sleeping well, and then their estrogen levels are all over the place, progesterone's declining, then it's very typical to, to have these changes in the mood. Um, so this is generally a pattern of liver chi stagnation, liver yang rising, or liver fire. And the formulas that I tend to use are, um, first of all, I'll tend to go for Xiao Yao Wan, Jiao Wei Xiao Yao Wan, or the Evergreen Calm formula, which is um, a modified Jiao Wei Xiao Yao Wan that has some additional herbs for nourishing the liver. Um, so that's a great one. Um, Long Dong Shei Gan Tong, if there's a lot of liver fire, or um, Chai Hu Longu Muli Wan, if you feel like the patient needs some, um, some anchoring. Um, so that, those are the typical formulas that I will use. And um, here's a case study of, uh, of a patient who was experienced some really terrible mood swings and irritability. So 47 year old woman, her chief complaint was excessive irritability. And she also had irregular periods, hot flashes and night sweats. Um, she had a, a history of breast cancer. And so she was on tamoxifen. She was on year two of a five-year course of tamoxifen. And so tamoxifen is an estrogen blocker. And so um, when a patient is on tamoxifen, they have lower dopamine and serotonin levels as a result of the lower estrogen. So um, it's very typical for mood changes to occur in patients on tamoxifen. Um, irritability is a very common side effect. Um, so this patient also had very high family stress going on. She, um, she had, uh, she had her three of her grandchildren living with her. Um, and she said that she felt like she was just constantly screaming at her grandchildren. Um, and it was really distressing for her. Um, she, as I said, she also had hot flashes and night sweats, but she was not as concerned about those, the, the feelings of rage and just out of control irritability were what brought her to the clinic. Um, she really wanted to get that under control. It was very distressing. So, um, the diagnosis for her was liver chi stagnation with yang rising kidney yin deficiency with deficiency heat. Her doctor said no herbs because she was on tamoxifen and her doctor did not um, want her taking um, anything that, um, that he didn't feel comfortable with. Um, so we didn't do herbs for her. I would have loved to have given her the evergreen calm formula. I think that would have been a great formula for her. Um, but she, she wanted to um, stick with the doctor's orders. So we just did acupuncture. And these are some of the typical points that I would use in a treatment with her. Now I didn't do all of these points every time, um, but these are, so I would, I would vary some of these, but typically I would do these points. Um, so first of all, I'll talk about the Miriam Lee 10 point combination, um, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with and probably use in your clinic. Um, but I'll go over them anyway. So the, um, the Miriam Lee points are large intestine four, large intestine 11, lung seven, stomach 36, and spleen six. And this is a, um, this is really a treatment to support the middle jowl. So Miriam Lee developed this protocol because she was seeing such a high volume of patients and wanted to be able to uh, do um, a treatment protocol that was easy to administer, that didn't require a lot of needles and didn't take a lot of time. And she would use this combination on the majority of her patients. Um, and, and so we use it every day at my clinic um, for, some, for something like this or for somebody who's really got any kind of internal condition. We kind of start with Miriam Lee's 10 points. Um, sometimes we'll do those bilateral. Sometimes we'll just do them on one side. So then it would really just be five points. 
Um, and then we might add other points um, to supplement that. Um, the Miriam Lee's points work really well for a number of reasons. First of all, you have large intestine four, which is gonna move chi. Um, and there's almost always some kind of stagnation with these patients. So large intestine four is gonna move chi. Large intestine 11 is gonna clear heat. And there's often some deficiency heat with these patients. Lung seven is going to support the lungs. Um, I think this is really important for perimenopausal patients because a lot of these patients are reckoning with loss in some way. They are grieving in some way. It might be their loss of fertility um, as they're entering menopause. It might be a loss of youth. You know, maybe they really valued being youthful and now they're losing that. Um, a lot of changes happen outside of the body during perimenopause, career changes, family changes. Um, at this stage of life, um, people might be, be losing family members, um, deaths of parents or other family members occur in middle age. So there's, there just typically tends to be some grieving in general. And then that's compounded in perimenopause with feeling of loss. And there's a feeling of loss of control over your own body because everything is different. The periods are different. The moods are different. Um, people start to wonder, you know, is this even my own body? Um, so I like lung seven to help support the lungs going through that grieving process. Um, stomach 36 is just a great point, of course, to support the middle jowl. Um, and then spleen six is going to support the spleen, the kidneys, and the liver, since it's the intersection of those three channels. Um, spleen six, of course, good for any gynecological conditions. So, um, so that Miriam Lee Tan combination is a great point for really um, any issues in perimenopause. Okay, so also for this patient, I would usually use do 20 and Sushin Song. Um, I, it, I would almost always do both of those. So five points on top of the head. Um, I really like do 20 just for regulating the upward downward flow of chi in the body. Sushin Song, I feel like is very effective for treating anxiety and irritability. I have a lot of patients who will request that combination because they feel like uh, it really helps them to just calm down and relax. And it was very effective for this patient as well. Um, I would typically do one or two ear points, usually ear shen men, um, sometimes also ear point zero, sometimes ear sympathetic, the ear brain point. Um, but yeah, in general, the ear points, these ear points are gonna have a relaxing, calming effect then liver two and three, I will usually do one or the other of these, or sometimes I'll do liver two on one side, liver three on the other side, because we definitely, for this patient, we were always trying to regulate the liver and, and move liver chi and want to clear liver heat and descend that rising yang. So I like liver two and three for those issues. Um, Kidney two, kidney three, kidney six. Again, sometimes I would do a combination of these or maybe do kidney three and kidney six on one side, kidney three and kidney two on the other side, and kidney three just as a general point for supporting the kidneys. Um, kidney two, I will usually select if the patient is experiencing more heat symptoms. And if, for this particular patient, if she would come in and her night sweats had been really bad, I would choose kidney two. Not so, not so much. I would choose kidney six um, to support the yin. Kidney six is still going to have some heat clearing effect, but kidney two is really going to draw that deficient heat down and anchor that. Um, and then I would also usually use gallbladder 40 on this patient to help to 
support the liver and regulate the liver. So um, this patient would come in one or two times a week. And after eight treatments, her mood had improved significantly. She was feeling much better, no longer screaming at her grandchildren, which she was very happy about. I'm sure her grandchildren were happy about that too. Um, so mood much better. She still felt stress. I mean, the, the stress wasn't going away, but she felt like she could handle it more. Um, she also still had night sweats, but they were less frequent. And she really wasn't all that distressed about the night sweats. She really just wanted to get her mood under control. Um, and so we continued at twice a month for maintenance, which she's still doing, and she's doing really well. So this was a good success story for mood changes. Okay, poor memory and cognition is another, another one that affects a lot of people in perimenopause. Studies have shown that up to 70% of perimenopausal women have problems with memory and cognition. Um, one study showed that women don't learn as well during perimenopause. So this, uh, this is troubling because this often corresponds with increased cognitive stressors at work or at home. It's just a stressful time of life for a lot of patients. Um, and then they feel like they can't think straight or they are forgetful. Um, and it's, it's a big problem for a lot of patients. So again, estrogen is at play here. Fluctuating estrogen levels affect the brain in a lot of ways. So estrogen has a vasodilating effect. So the brain isn't getting as much blood flow and blood is nourishment for the brain. The brain is the sea of marrow, as we know. So it's not getting the food that it needs. Um, estrogen also helps facilitate activity at the neuronal synapse. So when two neurons meet that space between them where they communicate, estrogen facilitates that. So lower estrogen means less communication. Estrogen also has a protective effect on the neurons um, from damage by free, free radicals and the amyloid protein. The amyloid protein has been linked to Alzheimer's. Estrogen also helps the brain grow new neurons and repair damaged neurons. And estrogen increases levels of dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. So estrogen has a pretty significant impact on the brain. Um, so when estrogen declines, it can certainly affect brain function. Um, so um, let's look at a typical treatment approach. So. With TCM treatment, I'll usually um, work on tonifying kidneys and supplementing Jing. We also wanna nourish and circulate the blood to support the sea of marrow. Um, tonify spleen to make more blood. Sometimes there is dampness as well with mental fog. There can be excess dampness kind of clouding that. Um, so the points I use for this typically, again, Miriam Lee's 10 point combination, Do 20 and Sushin Song. Um, I feel like uh, the, that combination of the five points on the head also helps with mental clarity in addition to helping with irritability and mood changes. I like gallbladder 39 because that's the sea of merit. And then I really like using auricular points for memory and cognition issues. So the brain point, sympathetic, shen men, um, those are some of the typical points, ear points that I'll use. Formulas, Evergreen Enhanced Memory Formula is great. It nourishes the heart. It tonifies Jing and circulates the blood. Um, if a person is more deficient, then Imperial Tonic is great. Um, has an overall tonifying effect. Also with points, um, sometimes I'll add points that will nourish and circulate the blood. So Spleen 10 and Liver 8 can be good points here as well. Um, okay. So let's talk about menstrual cycle changes. So lots of changes happen to the menstrual cycle during perimenopause. This is sometimes called the ovaries grand finale when it's just doing its thing in preparation for shutting down. So the cycles can become shorter. There can be spotting between the periods. There can be heavy periods. Um, there can be skipped periods. Um, so, um, in early perimenopause, these are caused usually by high estrogen and low progesterone. 
Um, sometimes the follicles are releasing multiple eggs per cycle. And then later on, as the estrogen more steadily declines, then patients will start to skip periods as well. Um, and then there's, there can be a lot of compounding issues with menstrual cycle changes. So there might be PCOS, there might be endometriosis, fibroids, cysts, um, the effects of fertility medications. So lots of things can contribute to changes with the menstrual cycle. Um, this can be really distressing for patients because a lot of times um, for years, if they don't have these compounding factors for years, they've had regular periods like clockwork. And then all of a sudden they'd have no idea when their period is coming. Um, and then of course, menstrual cycle changes are also compounded by stress. Um, and so this can cause more skipped periods. I was talking to a gynecologist recently and she calls 2020 the year of the skipped period because people were under so much stress in 2020 lots of skipped periods, lots of irregular cycles. Um, I, we're getting a little short on time and I wanna have time for questions. So I'm just gonna go through this um, kind of quickly here until the end. Um, typical patterns, there's, there can be a lot of patterns with menstrual cycle changes. So you really have to ask a lot of questions to find out what exactly is going on. Um, could be liver cheese stagnation, there could be some heat there, some blood stagnation in the lower jowl, some kidney indeficiency, could be some blood deficiency, could be spleen chi deficiency with dampness. Here are some of the typical formulas I'll use. Xiaoyao, Jiawei Xiaoyao or Calm if it's a liver pattern. Um, if there's blood stagnation, Guajir Fooling One or Resolve, Evergreen Resolve Lower is a great formula for that. Um, if it's more of a deficient heat formula, of course, Luwei Di Huang Wan or Jirbai Di Huang Wan. Um, Evergreen's Balance Heat or Nourish formulas are great. And then the Evergreen GI Tonic formula is great for spleen deficient patterns. So I've, let's talk about a case study here. So this is Grace, age 45. So um, she'd always had regular periods, very regular cycles. And then um, six months before starting acupuncture, she started having spotting before her period and then heavy bleeding and pain the first two days of her period. She also had increased irritability during the entire luteal phase. So the entire second two weeks of her cycle, increased irritability, sugar cravings, weight gain, and abdominal gas and bloating. So um, the diagnosis was liver chi stagnation, a um, little bit of yang rising, that, that element of it wasn't severe. And then spleen chi deficiency with dampness, which we saw with all of those symptoms in the luteal phase of the cycle. So points, again, Miriam Lee's 10 points, do 20, um, liver three, to regulate the liver. And then I will often use um, spleen nine or spleen 10, sometimes both, depending on where the patient is in her cycle or how she's feeling, but spleen nine for the dampness, spleen 10 for moving blood. Um, this patient, was has been resistant to taking herbs. She's still coming to see me. So I'm still working on her to try to get her to take herbs. So we've just been doing acupuncture. Um, so she started off doing treatment one or two times a week after eight treatments, her PMS had really improved a lot. Um, her irritability was still occurring, but she was only having it for two days premenstrually instead of two weeks. So two weeks to two days is a significant improvement. Um, she was still having spotting. Um, so for this patient, um, I think the evergreen calm formula would work really well uh, and GI tonic. Sometimes for spotting, I'll also do Bujang Yichitong because that has a, it tonifies the spleen and it has a um, effect to help the spleen hold the blood. Um, but in general, this has been a good outcome so far for this patient. She's still undergoing treatment. Um, and um, hopefully we can get her on some herbs too. But with just the acupuncture, she's doing really well. Okay, so um, some final thoughts on perimenopause. As I said, perimenopause includes many more symptoms than just these that I've talked about. Perimenopause can drag on for many years and it often coincides with lots of other life stressors in work and family. 
patients really need a lot of support during this time. Um, patients will, like I said, patients feel unprepared for this and they feel like they're the only one going through it because as a culture, we haven't talked a lot about perimenopause, although I feel like that's changing, which is a good thing. Um, but patients need a lot of support and they need to know that what they're going through is normal and that there is help for them and that they should be talking with other people about it too. Um, so TCM is not going to erase all of the symptoms because this is a natural phase of life, but it can significantly improve quality of life during perimenopause. Um, so I'm just gonna end by putting my contact information up here and I um, see we have some questions. So um, I'm gonna, let's see, how do I get to the questions? Mm -hmm. Let's do this. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute. Um, okay, so um, one question, do women who electively sterilization in their 30s experience perimenopausal symptoms and how long, um, tubes tied, et cetera? Yes, um, generally so, it, and it depends on, um, if someone has a hysterectomy versus having a tubal ligation. Um, but generally people are going to experience perimenopause anytime the hormones fluctuate with age. Um, if somebody has a hysterectomy in their thirties, then they're gonna be experiencing perimenopause um, earlier than they might if they hadn't had a hysterectomy. But yeah, this, uh, this pretty much occurs in everyone who has ovaries. Um, another, que another question is, do symptoms change or abate once they become postmenopausal? That is a great question. And I love the answer, which is yes. A lot of these symptoms do abate in, in menopause. So once the periods end, there's a leveling off of the hormones. So they don't fluctuate as much. There's, there's not as much estrogen, but there aren't these wild fluctuations. And in general, women in their later years in their 60s and 70s report higher levels of happiness in life. This has been studied. There have been um, surveys done on this. So yes, things do level out after perimenopause. There is hope past perimenopause. Um, somebody else asked if patients are open to herbs, do you start them with herbs right away? Or do you start acupuncture and add in herbs after a few treatments? I usually start with just acupuncture and see how they do and then add herbs if we're not getting to where we wanna be or if the patient is open with it. But sometimes, sometimes they don't need herbs. Sometimes the acupuncture is enough. Their body kind of self-regulates and, and then they're good to go. Um, any particular dietary advice you recommend? That is, um, it really depends on the patient um, and that could be a, a, a whole different class. Um, I tend not to give a lot of dietary advice to my patients because I work in community acupuncture. It's very fast paced. I don't have a whole lot of time to talk to patients. And so usually my talking is getting information from them. Um, have you encountered patients who get hot flashes and report that their mothers had hot flashes for decades? Is that just ongoing yin deficiency usually? Yes, there does seem to be a genetic component here. So a patient, a perimenopausal person whose mother had hot flashes for a long time, then that person will tend to have hot flashes for a long time. And um, some people do experience hot flashes well into menopause into post-menopause. So maybe they haven't had a, peri a period for years. They might still experience hot flashes. Most people don't, but some do. And that seems to have a genetic component. Okay. Young patient, 29 years old, irregular periods, only has one kidney. It appears as though the progesterone levels may be low, blood clotting, lengthened period, any herbal formulas you would recommend? Um, hmm. Blo blood clotting and lengthened periods. So um, this is probably some blood stagnation 
and um, maybe some kidney deficiency. Um, I love I love the Evergreen Resolve lower for blood stagnation conditions. So when I have patients who have real clotty periods or they have fibroids, um, then I'll usually start with Resolve lower, uh, and that can have a really profound effect. Um, so yeah, I imagine that blood stagnation is probably what's going on with this, um, with this 29 year old patient with the irregular periods. Um, any correlation with C-sections and earlier onset and or duration of perimenopause? I don't know. That's a very interesting question. And I have not looked at any research. I haven't looked for the research on that. So, um, that'll be something interesting to look into. Um, I'm trying to think anecdotally. Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. That would be really interesting to study because, uh, you know, a C-section does affect the hormones. There's not the cascade of hormones that occur during childbirth, during a vaginal childbirth when someone has a C-section. So that could very easily affect. I'm going to look into that. Thank you for that question. Do you see a lot of frontal headaches surface during perimenopause where the patients never have a history of headaches? Yes, I do. Um, and then all of a sudden they're getting headaches and migraines and perimenopause. Yes. Usually a liver chi stagnation, liver yang rising pattern. Um, so again, calm, I love the evergreen calm formula that, and that's probably where I would start and then just do some points for, uh, for balancing the liver, but yes, um, headaches that patients have not had headaches or migraines before, and then they start having them in perimenopause. Yes, that is one of the, those and other symptoms um, that happens. What are typical symptoms of decreasing or low testosterone in perimenopausal women? Um, that is typically fatigue and low libido. And low libido is another really distressing symptom for perimenopausal patients. Um, Patients are not ready to lose their libido. They do not want their sex life to end, but they have no sex drive. Um, and that's very distressing. And I didn't have time to get into all of that today, but yeah, absolutely. That's a symptom of low testosterone and you know, kidney, kidney yang tonic formulas will generally help with that. I know a woman who was on HRT into her eighties was taken off big decline in mood and hair shine, et cetera. I'm sure that is true. Um, again, I don't have time to get into talking about HRT, but um, uh, yeah, that's a whole different subject. And yes, when patients are taking HRT and they come off of it, then they can, they definitely can experience some symptoms. Skin is dry, vaginal dryness, sometimes hot flashes come back. Um, lately, I've been seeing more and more female patients in 30s and 40s, still on birth control. How much do you think this impacts perimenopause? Do you ever speak with patients about getting off birth control at a certain age? My feeling is that anytime a patient takes any type of supplemental hormone, then it is going to affect their own hormones in some way. So prolonged use of birth control can have an impact because the body is just not naturally used to doing all of this on its own. Um, so, Yes, um, it, having a conversation with, um, with a patient about coming off birth control, I do do that sometimes, but there's a, there's a lot to it and because there are a lot of reasons why a patient might be on birth control. If they're on birth control to manage symptoms, then yes, we can use acupuncture and herbs to manage symptoms instead of birth control, but there might be a lot of other reasons why they're on birth control. Um, any suggestions for PCOS formula? Yes. Uh, er, oh, I'm totally blanking on it. Um, what's the formula for phlegm damp formula? There's a, um, there's, it's called lucid channels um, from, um, I'm totally blanking on the manufacturer, um, but it's, it's a formula for phlegm damp in the middle jowl. Um, I tend to see, um, PCOS as a, a damp condition. Um, GI tonic to tonify the spleen can also, um, can also help with PCOS um, and resolve lower if there is some blood stagnation. Um, okay, is that every, 
everyone's question. I want to just make sure I've answered questions. Um, oh, there are a bunch of other questions in the chat. Okay, I'll see if I, I'm going to just keep answering questions. I know we're getting up right here on an hour, um, but, um, but yes, I'll just keep answering questions. Um, okay, we talked about Miriam Lee 10, age 53, still have periods, horrendous migraine headaches. Yes. So migraines, we talked about that. Very typical. Um, okay. Um, mm -hmm, low testosterone. Have you seen an increase in heart palpitations? Um, I have, that's not one of the more typical symptoms that I've seen, but yes, I do sometimes see that. And I, for, from my experience, a lot of times that's a heart blood deficiency issue pattern. Um, any special considerations in perimenopausal women with a history of breast cancer? Um, yeah, I think that um, you just have to have a conversation with them about herbs. Is Did they have an estrogen dependent cancer? How comfortable are they um, taking herbs? Um, but um, but other than that, as far as point selection, not really any special considerations. Um, let's see. Yes, yeah, 12 magical point combination for hormonal headaches. Also very good um, point combination. I don't tend to use this one as much in the clinic, but yes, very helpful. Modification you can recommend with Xiao Yao San or other formula if the patient also has problem with cold phlegm and dampness together with the liver chi stagnation. Um, I would just, I would just pair it with a formula for phlegm damp. Um, yes. I can't believe I'm blanking on the name of this formula. It'll come to me. Um, oh yeah. Somebody mentions, um, C-sections have significant blood loss. That is an excellent point. So more blood deficiency signs for patients who've had C-sections or multiple C-sections. Um, have you treated any male patients who go through a male version of the perimenopausal phase? What are similarities and differences from that of women? Um, I have, and that is, um, there, that's hard to get into in this setting because there are a lot of considerations, but yes, um, men's hormones fluctuate, male, male hormones fluctuate as well. Um, and decline with age. Um, how do you feel about those who say it's more about the ratio of progesterone to estrogen, the, re the respective levels? That's a really good point. And there was a study that I looked at about the ratio. So high estrogen by itself isn't necessarily a problem, um, but it's high estrogen paired, compared with low progesterone. That's when there typically um, tend to be a lot of those um, issues related to high estrogens. Um, a lot of studies are showing that it's really high relative estrogen. What formula would you recommend for breast cysts that are developing in perimenopausal women? Again, the phlegm damp formula. <laughs> Can someone help me out and remember the name of the phlegm damp formula? It's one of the most common formulas we use. Um, the formula for phlegm damp is um, kind of my go-to for any urshan one. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Urchin Tong. <laughs> now everybody but me remembers the name of this formula. Urchin Tong. That's what I would use. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Oh yeah. Important consideration. Elderly women need to be careful with HRT can cause a stroke. Um, th yeah. It's, there's so much more to say about HRT, which we don't have time for, unfortunately. Um, yes, lucid channel by, by con herbs is urchin tongue. So yeah, I will usually use, use the lucid channel formula. It's urchin tongue. Um, considerations for helping someone get off hormonal therapy if requested. Um, yeah, generally I will, um, supplement with herbs if the patient is, is open to it. Um, there's a lot of considerations there. And again, we don't have a ton of time. Um, so I think with that, we can end because we've gone a little past. Um, and I put my contact information up and it'll be in the lecture notes. So please feel free to email me if you have any questions, because I would love to um, I would love to continue the conversation with anybody who's interested. 
And Donna, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, my turn. Thank you, Alexa, for a great class today. Um, Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We hope you guys learned a lot. It seems so. A lot of people were asking great questions. And thank you so much for taking the time to answer them, Alexa. This webinar today is being recorded, and it will be available on our TCM Wisdom Tube and our YouTube tomorrow afternoon. And you guys can watch it again if you like, if you miss anything, or you just want to hear it again, or if you just, if you right if you missed anything um again it's on our tc wisdom tube and our youtube it's free for you to watch the video replay that's it for today everyone thank you so much and we'll see you at our next webinar have a great day bye thank you